Okay, good. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to module CM4282. Um, and this is the lecture on networks, that is electricity, um, distribution, and transmission from uh, generator to consumer. Um, we're going to, it's part of the storage and distribution technologies uh, unit. Um, we're first going to look at the structure of uh, a distribution grid system, and you'll see that grid and distribution actually have different meanings in this context, uh, and some of the uh, issues associated with a, a typical grid or network system. We'll then look at some of the requirements of the uh, grid or network system to supply beyond supplying power, but things like continuity um, and the uh, strategies employed to generate to demand. Especially important, some national grid systems, like for instance New Zealand, are completely standalone, so that at any time generation must equal demand or supply must equal demand. In other systems, like maybe the UK, which is a very connected grid system, um, that requirement is less important. Uh, but of course, the more that you import from other grid systems, the more expensive it gets. And finally, we'll look at the economics of the uh, electricity system and some particular issues around so-called smarts. Typically, the course books, Twiddle and Weir, have a small section on grids. And in fact, I found no mainline textbook, general textbook, which has detail on some aspects of this. So there is some more specialised reading here. Please do not go and haul out these large books and read these tomes cover to cover. However, uh, you might find a little browse through uh, a couple of them would be useful. At least it will resolve maybe questions that the lecture leaves. Um, and the course book by Mackay, again, there's a lot of calculations which are related to grid stuff, but it's not about, his book is not about such things, so the coverage is not good. We'll start the lecture with a, a little consideration about why we have national grids at all. Well, the first answer is to efficiently distribute services. And for electricity, uh, a conductive grid or network makes a lot of sense. That word efficiently is important. Uh, especially with electricity, there are safety issues, there's a whole range of issues, um, which we'll deal with a bit later in the lecture. Okay, so why do we have national grids? Well, there are two main scenarios, aren't there? The first scenario is small rural communities, low population, low um, large spaces, basically. And that's what we're going to look at first. And we're going to use a brief example from Tasmania in Australia. OK, the first question you might legitimately ask is, uh, where is Tasmania? OK, well, there you go. Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia. And there's a little bit right at the bottom there, which is Tasmania. It's a number of islands. The main island is about 350 by 300 kilometers. It's got a population of half a million, give or take, of which the capital city, Hobart, has 60%. And it's a cool, temperate climate. Uh, what that means is it's actually quite close to Antarctica. It gets really quite chilly down there. Um, and uh, we'll look at some of that stuff now. So here's a topographic map of Tasmania, and you can see that you have lots of mountains, lots of raised, uh, raised land, high land, which of course means 
probably cold nights, maybe cool days, and snow and ice in winter. And this is the electricity grid. Uh, this is Australia up here, and you can see the main type of grid that you would expect. There is a single line joining Tasmania to the mainland. It's a long line, 350 miles or so. And you can see that the electricity grid in Tasmania, and obviously the red lines are local distribution network, and the big thick blue ones are grid network. Um, you can see it's very simple, which means that the system is quite sparse, not many people, everybody's spread long way apart. So that's a typical rural type community. Not any large energy intensive industries, and there's a lot of local energy resources there. Good wind, good hydro, good wave. Um, solar's not so brilliant at 42 South, but uh, nonetheless. So that's one scenario. Um, and I want you to decide whether that's a good scenario to have a national grid or not. If you compare the other scenario. So we think large concentrated urban populations, the cities, uh, take Singapore as an example, urban density about 8,000 people per square kilometer in 2012. Dhaka, the great uh, Asian cities, uh, same units, 44,000 per kilometer. Mumbai, about 31,000 per square kilometer. And so it goes on. You don't need me to tell you probably. It makes really very little sense to have a uh, an invested and high density network when most of what you've got out there are trees, mountains and sheep. Um, whereas in cities like this, actually, there's a lot of point. The other aspect, of course, is when you've got somewhere with very low population and very remote, you really can't get economies of scale. Everything is expensive and difficult. But in cities, yep, there are um, many, many advantages. So of the two scenarios, I think you know what I'm going. Why would you have a national grid? Actually, it really only makes sense where you've got a lot of people. What is a national grid? Now, the exact definition changes from country to country. But let's actually just generally look at the components. So you have power sources, maybe wind, wave, nuclear, fossil, everything you've got that generates. The uh, outputs from those stations goes through a transformer, which jumps up the voltage to many hundreds of thousands of volts, which then is injected onto the national grid. Now, the national grid or the main transmission network is the long distance job. It will transport power across the country. That's what it's designed to do. Eventually, you get to a place where you want to start supplying houses and people. So you step the voltage down again through another transformer and then you send it on local distribution networks. These are lower voltage and we'll talk about them later. They're not systems that you want to transport electricity hundreds of miles on. Um, typically maybe 10 miles is quite enough. And then finally from there, maybe via a pole transformer, um, less in this country I think, most of the stuff here is underground, then actually to the houses. Now, the definition of different parts of what a national grid is changes. Usually it includes everything from the substation transformer going in to the substation transformer going out. These substation transformers uh, are usually linked with something called grid connection points, where uh, actually that's where you put power in or take power out of the grid. Uh, 
In some countries, the distribution networks are also owned and operated by the national grid operator. Um, that's becoming more unusual. This is really a cultural change. In the past, the national grid owned everything from the generators right the way through to the meter in your house. Gradually, certainly as different countries have moved differently, that's tended to, concent to concentrate and to contract because now private businesses own the most of the generators, a private business owns the transmission networks, and then distribution networks are usually owned by the companies that actually supply the electricity to your door. Now, we talked a little bit about efficiency of uh, generation in the previous lectures. Let's now have a, a more overlooking picture. This, I apologize for the lurid colors. This is uh, a little sketch of efficiencies and losses. So we have, if you think of the national grid from generation through to use in the house, average efficiency of domestic appliances, we have various stages of the power going from the power station to you. So let's take a madly optimistic efficiency of 50% for generation. Remember, um, that's a lot better than the ranking average, which is still at 30. Um, so 50% is less good than gas turbines, but it's uh, pretty optimistic. Um, that's an efficiency. Then uh, transforming uh, up to the grid. Actually, that's um, you have about 2% losses transforming up, transforming down. Um, and about 2% losses transferring over the grid. So basically uh, what's happening here is you're dropping down uh, each efficiency uh, loss. Uh, then you go on to the distribution networks, much smaller. So uh, then you uh, have greater losses. You lose more on the distribution networks than you do over the main grid transmission. And finally, you have the average efficiency of domestic appliances. Obviously, this will vary between countries. So let's now think of those efficiencies as losses and then do a cumulative loss. So if we've got 50% losses at generation, that means we've only got 50% of the remaining 100% available to us. 2% loss at the grid means that 50% goes to 48%. Another 3% loss of um, of that is 45%, 43 and so you come down this line. Eventually, your total remaining is a mere 23% of the energy that you started with in the fuel. Uh, so your losses are uh, effectively almost 80% of that energy. Um, so it varies from country to country, but you'd be naive to say that the losses are less than 50%. They're undeniably a lot more than 50%. I think a reasonable average might be over 80% loss actually, but that'll give you a feel for this. But this means that the answer to increasing demand, and we'll look at this later, is not necessarily just increasing generation. Energy efficiency is actually an economic and environmental way to increase supply side capacity and reduce demand side. And there's two terms here that I've just used and I should tell you we're gonna keep using them. Supply side is literally the generation side getting power to meet demand and demand side is you and me and industries that are using electricity all the time. Let's now uh, move on to Singapore. The national grid here, well you have three major power stations. You have Sunoco, you have Tuas and you have Soraya on Jurong Island. Um, most of these are 
uh, modern gas turbine power stations. Singapore is not the best example to use for a national grid uh, because A, it's very, very simple. It's a small island. And secondly, the uh, commercial environment is slightly different to many other places. So here is the power, here is the grid. I'm probably not going to talk about it very much. I'm instead going to draw examples from other grids. But what I'm about to say now, what I've said about losses applies here. And what I'm about to say now, where I think about uh, some of those uh, concepts a bit further, also applies. So the grid, the national grid, the power transmission grid is about transmission over long distances. Now, remember ohmic heating, Joule's law, where the amount of heat generated Q is proportional to the current squared. That's why when you're looking at transmission over long distances, you do not want a lot of current because that's going to heat your conductors, which is going to reduce their efficiency or increase their resistance. So typically in the grid systems, you might have 230,000 volts up to 750,000 volts. The issues here are quite significant. They're climate related. So in climates where you get cold winters, the same type of conductor can carry more energy than maybe in Singapore where everything gets hot. If you put cables underground, they're cooler. You can usually carry more power. Um, okay, I won't talk about transformer losses. Effectively, it's work and energy. So if you go past a substation, you'll hear the humming. That's losing energy. There's energy going to making that noise. That's part of the losses of transformers. Corona losses. Um, if you've ever stood under a um, power pylon when it's raining, you can sometimes see it sparking or hear the noise. That's corona arcing. Um, and effectively what you're doing is you're ionizing the air in close proximity to the insulators. Uh, one way of reducing that is multi-strand cables, which are widely used. But um, typically you don't, uh, there's no getting away from, from it when you're using uh, the sort of voltages that are in the national grid. Um, the material you make your cables out of is also important and you have a playoff here. If you use aluminium, it's very light, but it doesn't have such a good conductivity as something like copper, which is heavier. So to carry the same amount of power, aluminium cables have to be thicker, which of course increases the weight. Um, typically, line losses is what an average number for a temperate climate, 6%. In summer or Singapore, you might be looking at 8% um, because of the increased resistance. Uh, distribution networks, as I said before, are not the main national grid. They are smaller type affairs and they only run at 35 kilovolts, not 230. And they're typically over short distance and they're usually owned by the people who sell you the electricity. Okay, so let's think a little bit about types of vulnerabilities. We've already talked about above ground and underground. We've talked about copper and aluminium, where you're playing off weight versus conductivity, basically. Above ground means you're vulnerable to bad weather. And remember, violent storms are predicted to increase under climate change. Underground, on the other hand, you're protected from that, but you are vulnerable to flooding. So you pays your money and you take your chance depending on which climate regime and which events you think are most or least likely. This is just to 
give you these are the statistics of actually the UK national grid 28,000 kilometers of transmission 11,500 kilometers at 400 kilovolts 9,800 kilometers at 275 kilovolts 5,000 kilometers at 132 kilovolts so uh, you've got a lot of network here it's a major investment so we talked about vulnerabilities of materials um, above ground and underground, aluminium versus copper, just as two examples. There are other examples of materials. There is another vulnerability, which is around frequency control, and they are termed automatic incidents. They are not accidents in this, well, they're accidents in the sense that you don't plan them, but they're not accidents in terms of trees falling over and taking out power lines and things like that, or a flood occurring and taking out uh, one of the links in the grid. For reasons which will become clear later, uh, in a, a grid system, in most grid systems in the world actually, you need to maintain a specific alternating current frequency. And that's usually 50 hertz. It's 50 hertz here, it's 50 hertz in Europe, in New Zealand, in Australia, in the US. In fact, I don't know anywhere where it isn't 50 hertz. Now, the frequency goes down if you take power out of the grid. Um, so there's a, a window on there, plus or minus 2%. So if it goes up to 52%, it's fine. 52 hertz, it's fine. If it goes to 48 hertz, it's fine. And this frequency is maintained moment by moment using fast reserve generation, typically fuel cells. Uh, there's, there's a whole list you could, you could use, um, pump storage. Um, basically to make sure that sudden demand doesn't drop the frequency below 48%. Um, as well as fast reserve, they have what's called plumbed in load shedding or integrated load shedding. So what happens is I'm a big company maybe and I have very large energy demand. My electricity company will approach me and say, look, we'll give you a cheaper rate if you will let us wire your supply so that if we have, for instance, a frequency uh, incident, which is what we're talking about now, we can just disconnect your supply probably for a few seconds and then put it back again just to keep the uh, frequency above 48. And most industries can work with that because they have local capacity to, to buffer their frequency for uh, a few minutes. To give you an idea, and we're talking about the UK situation here, the margin of safety is about 1500 megawatts. And to give you a <laughs> comparison here a medium-sized nuclear power station is about 1360 megawatts so effectively it's about a decent sized power station now this is a UK incident and the last major automatic accident was in 2008 in the UK in May and as often happens with accidents a coincidence occurred two separate power stations for different reasons tripped out. That is, a condition occurred within the power station, which meant it stopped pushing power into the grid for a local reason. Now, they tripped out within maybe a minute of each other, pure blind coincidence. The effect of one power station tripping out, this margin of safety, was okay. The hertz, you know, the frequency went down to maybe 48 and a half, but hertz, but it's fine. The second one tripping out dropped the frequency below 48. When the frequency drops below 48, other power stations begin to trip out because the frequency is actually like a control for a uh, generation. So what happened is users tripped out so people with these agreements that their power went off and there was a rolling effect across the uk where many many power stations tripped out 
um, which of course makes the problem worse because power stations are pushing energy into the grid, keeping the frequency up. For this to happen meant that effectively there were power cuts across more than two thirds of domestic customers and lots and lots of the industrial demand tripped so that demand fell so the frequency went up which then stabilized the situation now this doesn't happen when an industry has agreed to let its power be turned off that's called voluntary load shedding involuntary load shedding is a power cut so actually there's someone's or it's not someone automatically load was shed the power went off for domestic and for commercial until the frequency could get back above 50. If the frequency, apart from the automatic instance that I've just been talking about, if the frequency drops below 48 is a, is a good number or somewhere around there, then there are actually instrumental problems with the way that power stations and transformer stations work and it can cause quite a lot of damage so it's a safety a safety net really um, m many you can even think about this on your domestic equipment many appliances or equipment um, if the frequency falls below the specified uh, 50 hertz actually you can no longer guarantee the operation of the equipment. It's all sorts of interesting little quirks that go on. Okay, what I'd like to do now is continue this and do a UK case study and look at the UK national grid as it's big enough and complicated enough um, that there's interesting things to say about it. Okay, this is the backbone, the main high density lines of the national grid in the UK and I want you to uh, notice that first of all there are connections to other grids so um, there's a major connection here to northern European Scandinavian grids so there are cables DC links that go underneath the North Sea um, links here to France their national grid. Uh, links here also to France, links here to Belgium, and internal grid links to Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom, and the Republic of Ireland, which is an independent country, but in terms of power, they're quite closely linked. The, some of these things here are particular reception points so for instance in where's it gone there there is a whole bank of fast response fuel cells but as we'll learn later there are issues in using those in a grid uh, not terminal issues actually quite overcome the issues but that's why there's a triangular point there as a reception point okay so we'll continue and now the grid is broken down a little more because you have all of the English and Welsh transmission systems going down another level, not just the major transmission now, but the um, regional transmission and in Scotland. Um, I, don't, I don't need to keep talking about that. And let's maybe look at some grid um, statistics. The maximum demand in the UK is now about 65,000 megawatts. Um, that represents about 85% of the capacity of the grid. The network has about 180 large power stations and fixed losses of between 250 and 350 megawatts. Dual heating, that's the transmission grid losses, maybe somewhere just under 900 megawatts. Transformer losses, um, total losses. When you're dealing with 63,000 megawatts or 65,000 megawatts, maybe 1,000 megawatts isn't very much. And the UK national grid uh, 
loses about 3% of its capacity. And there are high voltage DC links, uh, obviously to Europe and other places. And there are connectors to Northern Ireland, Ireland, and some of the offshore islands. We now need to, we're still thinking about at the moment, the supply side, in terms of storage and response, and we'll learn how important storage is in a moment. There are um, prototype fast fuel cell facilities. This is one, actually, at the uh, Isle of Dogs. Um, there's pump storage, which we've talked about in the previous lectures, and there's high voltage DC links. So apart from gas, coal, nuclear, um, there are still, I think, some oil power stations. Um, you also have this whole tranche and wind, obviously, and a little wave. Um, there's this whole tranche of fast response systems. Let's now look at the shape, if you like, the morphology of the supply side. Uh, and this is like a diagram of the UK transmission system. Now, there are embedded parts to this and there are directly connected parts. Uh, so typically the automatic load shedding we were talking about is would be an example of embedded. Okay, so here is our transmission system. So we have large power stations, medium power stations, and small power stations, which are pushing straight into the um, national grid system. You have import from external systems. So that's um, DC grids, for, uh, um, high voltage DC links, for instance. So that's the grid and that's exported to directly connected systems like pump storage. So when you're, when you've got extra power at night, so you then um, shunt off some of the extra power you've got to pump water uphill. Uh, the grid powers all the station transformer demands that uses power. That's not powered by the power station. It's powered by the national grid. And that's an important point we'll get to in a minute. Um, sometimes the grid will export power to France or Belgium to an external system. And it also services what's called non-embedded customer demand. Uh, then you go to the network system. That's the, it leaves the grid there. And there you have some network station, some um, smaller generators, like some of the small hydro and wind that we were talking about. If they're large enough, they'll be plumbed into the national grid. But if they're smaller, they'll go into a distribution networks, medium, small, customer generation. And in some cases, import from external systems which are not the national grid. Again, um, I won't bore you with this, but, but there are uh, smaller scale link systems that can support distribution networks and of course custom, customer demand. So it's not a straightforward bundle of wires. There's an awful lot of stuff that goes on. We're still thinking about supply side morphology, which is the generation side. Um, and this is a sketch, a little sketch graph, well, it's, it's a real graph actually. We've got uh, years here from 2011 up to 2025. Um, and we've got capacity there in gigawatts. And what this is, is a diagram, the key is down here, for how the supply side of the national grid is changing. Here is the time. Here is the capacity. This dark, this sort of funny blue color under here is decommissioned, closed power stations. Some of them are permanently decommissioned. That means they've been dismantled. Others have been decommissioned and mothballed in case they may be needed in the future. Uh, the other things here are 
uh, the increase in, for instance, nuclear power here. Um, policy in the UK now is to expand nuclear again. Uh, and you can see how the various different uh, energy demands, you've got wind there, and you've got other renewables, how they um, rise and fall. Um, uh, closed circuit gas turbine and things like that. This is important because there are issues of stability on a network which are determined by how you fuel or fire or charge that network. Um, and we'll talk a lot about that in a few seconds. So, when the mix of energy that you put into your supply side changes, that means your system either can become more stable or become less stable or stay much the same. In a modern technological world, power cuts are simply not an option. It costs too much. Um, so what the previous diagram just showed you is that energy sources into the grid are changing. And there are good commercial reasons as to why that should be the case. The issue is this third part. The energy sources to the grid are changing in that the energy sources themselves have different time bases. So let's look at, a, for a moment, an energy source which has a long time base, nuclear, or uh, a big fossil station. Predictable, short of an emergency happening, uh, reliable. Uh, so, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a moment as to what energy sources you put in different roles. But let's think about wind. Wind is not reliable. Even if you build your stations in the right place and you've done all your homework, actually, climate is not totally predictable. You can end up with no wind, which means no power, which means that your network is more destabilized because you have to scramble around and find other power sources to keep the lights on. Now, there is a very major problem with renewables, wind, wave, uh, tidal, and some hydro, which means that you can't, when you run a national grid, just hope it'll be okay. You've got to guarantee that the lights stay on. So, what we're looking at here is a uh, a graph of the morphology of uh, wind power, actually. Offshore power, wind power, and onshore wind power. And it's great, all green, as you can see the years going by, there's more and more wind. Now, if you do the modeling, and I won't bore you with this at the moment, when your supply side of your grid has reached 20% renewables, 20% wind typically, because that's one of the biggies. Um, now that in the UK is a temperate climate. So in summer when there's, when peak capacity is quite low, uh, it needs to reach 40 gigawatts. In winter, that means 60 gigawatts. When you reach 20% of those peak capacities, it becomes no longer statistically possible to maintain the grid to the same level of surety. Because then, if you're losing 10, 15% of your grid capacity because the wind stops blowing, you've got to have the equivalent amount of power ready to come in. Now, it's no good saying, we've got pump storage, that's fine, because the wind might die in the middle of the afternoon. And that peak storage, uh, pump storage, for instance, is actually designed to cover peak. 
and there's not enough capacity to be running it most of the day as well, as well as peak, just to keep uh, keep that going. So let's think about this. These numbers you've already seen. Power stations of the 63,000 megawatts, which is 80 odd percent of capacity, demand generation is 48 gigawatts. That means that that stations you've got, which are, they're already, you're, you're planning for that, that's fine. Anything above that begins to be a problem and is called peak. In 2013 and in 2015, the contribution of wind to the UK national grid caused problems of those those types because the amount of storage required and fast response storage uh, was to be blunt more than was available now uh, high voltage DC links help enormously but nonetheless um, you, you you've really you really begin to take risks uh, at that level so it's in some time in some parlances it's called moving mass capacity or a spinning wheel capacity named after the old uh, rotary bills okay so that's really um, mostly about supply side now we'll look at demand side about the demands on the grid and this is a little sketch graph uh, remember the UK um, is temperate summer and winter so winter demand is higher than summer demand and um, because obviously in those climates you need to heat although as climate begins to change there is beginning to be a summer air conditioning demand now and that's certainly the case in other places as well but this is if you want one annual cycle one day cycle so this is from half past midnight to half past midnight well no to midnight and so this is what we talked about the, the daily shape uh, of demand now if we uh, look at this in terms of weekly maximum because uh, if you have to supply it then you need to think about how that changes uh, over the year you've got a, a daily cycle that you just saw uh, for winter and summer this is the annual cycle which relates to the difference between summer and winter and you can see that the minimum and maximum again vary consistent with the last graph that you saw this is an important graph it's the percentage of peak demand for the percentage of time so let's take peak 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 the absolute top the lowest amount of time in this case a few percent you have to be at 90 percent network capacity i'm sorry the better now currently in the uk grid 80 percent of the time you're at about 50% of the grid capacity of peak demand. So that's a very useful curve to remember. It shows you how hard you're pushing the system, how much risk you're taking. Okay, so we have a complicated situation. Now let's come to the person whose responsibility it is to keep the lights on. He's called a demand engineer. What is his ideal curve? Okay, that's his ideal curve. From midnight to whenever, absolutely constant. That's easy to generate to. What is he really faced with? This is a an actual January 2013. This is six o'clock on Tuesday the 29th of January to 6 a.m. Uh, Thursday the 31st so it's UK winter and you can see that the red dots are consumption 
and the blue dots are gross. So he's generating, some of the time it's in balance, he's generating more than he needs there, more than he needs there, pretty much down here it's about equal, and then more than he needs here. So he's powering his pump storage. Today his demand was slightly lower than it would be. But what sort of shape is that when you've got to bring power stations on and you can't just flick a switch and put power stations on. Only certain types of power station have the morphology that you need to do that. Okay, so here is now a sketch cartoon of that. Um, and you can see in midnight uh, the demand is falling, then overnight it's very low and then it rises during the day, then you get peak which is in the evening and then it falls off and you have changes between weekdays and weekends. This curve has been split, the red is peak, the movie colour is intermediate and blue is base load which is the strategy that's been designed to generate to those sorts of curves. The shape is broadly regular, but you've got large variation and different energy sources are best for generating this as opposed to this as opposed to that, because of course this is more expensive than that, which is more expensive than that. Um, and in terms of your times, there you are. Base load is all the time. Mid range is from five in the morning to nine at night, and peak are the other times. And that's just to remind you of peak, mid range, and base load. Okay. So, what sorts of generation are best for the different three types? Well, base load. You want as much as possible in here, it's cheap, it's heavy duty, so you have nuclear stations on 24 hours a day, you have fossil stations on 24 hours a day. To start a nuclear station up takes a number of days. To start a fossil station up, if it's ready heated, takes about four or five hours, but otherwise takes longer than that. So that's base load. Mid-range, not so cheap. You need heavy duty, but you have what are called day stations. Uh, so typically they'll go in, the shift starts at three in the morning, it'll be kept warm, and they start generating by about half past five in the morning. Um, so they're active from about five in the morning till nine at night. And peak. These are the really expensive stations, the ones that only generate at peak. Pumped hydro, storage, DC links, fast fuel cells gas turbines and we'll look at some of those in another lecture uh, in the series and I've tried to match the colour to the, the diagram not very successfully. So the structure of demand is summarised here and it leads to two major sets of strategies. One is the temporal strategy of base load, mid range and peak the second is the power strategy, the capacity strategy. So if you can drop load at uh, a peak, it's called peak clipping, then that's a good thing to do because you're going to save a lot of money. Load shedding agreements we already referred to. Ripple control for hot water so that with some companies you can sign an agreement that at peak they will turn your... Uh, heater down or off using something called ripple control um, and again it all helps. What happens if it all goes horribly wrong? The, the real disaster is when you have synchronized unexpected high peaks. Uh, these two guys, the lady, uh, the, the late Princess Diana of Wales and uh, existing Charles, Prince of Wales of the British Royal Family, got married on the 14th of August 1981. I know because I got married seven days later on the 21st. Uh, you can imagine a national thing like this on all TV stations and the two 
the th two major TV stations. One has commercials, one doesn't. And it so happened that the commercial break where the adverts are on one station occurred at the same time on the other station as a retrospective. Basically, the action had died for a little while, so they, they showed you, I don't know, the Queen's Swans or something, I, I don't know. Um, what happened then is that everybody who'd been watching for like 40 minutes or an hour got up, put the kettle on to make a cup of tea and went to the loo. Electric kettles are very, very high power. Um, I've actually got the data for what happened in that seven or eight minutes, but we came to within probably 10 seconds of a complete national power cut because the sudden unexpected demand took demand above peak. Um, as it happened, strategically, um, there's these high voltage DC links and the French would love, love to know this, but it was their power that kept the royal wedding on the air. How embarrassing is that? Well, embarrassing if you're English anyway. Okay, final couple of slides. Um, there's a couple of implications about a grid. They're designed to stay energized. The UK national grid has never been de-energized since the 1890s when it was first put together. It's a giant capacitor, which is why people get killed every year climbing 400 kilovolt pylons when there's no current flowing. They are capacitors. Um, and the person on the, on the pylon provides a route to earth. But what happens when the power does go out? Your power stations just can't come on because it's the grid that powers the transformers and everything else. Now there is some residual capacitance, but Singapore shares this with the UK. They have what are called black star stations. They're usually large stations and they can self start with no grid power. So for instance, in New Zealand, they have them as well. They're diesel engines that start from battery. Uh, in the UK, they are hydro stations, hydro pumped stations that can just open and start generating. Um, and I think it's difficult to confirm that in Singapore, Tuas and Saraya are your black start stations. Uh, but it's slightly more difficult to get information um, in Singapore than it is in the other places that I've conventionally worked in. Okay, so how does the model work for electricity? Um, basically, there's an auction. It starts a couple of days before the actual uh, power is required. And they have a model based on past demand. It allows what your predicted demand is for every half an hour. And uh, the generators uh, bid for, you know, okay, I can supply 200 megawatts at one cent a kilowatt hour or whatever. But each bid subsequently must be higher. When the required amount is met, because they have a certain number of kilowatts to uh, sell or buy, the bidding closes and everybody gets the highest price it got to. Um, that allows generators and other companies to upgrade and build new generation as is needed and costs are controlled by the size of the charge. Base load is contracted in the same way but is only open to a couple of selected generators and you've seen this before. So the more expensive generating methods are designed to work at peak, not at base load. Um, okay. Okay, I'm probably not going to talk more about this very much. Um, I will talk a little about smart meters. At the moment, the consumer doesn't know how expensive electricity is. They get charged an average price, whether they use it at peak or whether actually they use, they use it at night when it's very cheap. Smart meters allow conversations between the customer's meter 
and the suppliers network and give you variable tariffs. So you can cut your electricity bills as a consumer if you choose to use your power, not at peak. And that's where this whole thing works. And I'll let you read this, there's no need me reading it out to you. So, smarts, the final couple of slides. Um, smart meters and smart networks are the application of IT to electrical distribution and grid networks, up to and including the consumer's property. And smarts comprise of smart networks and smart meters. But to make this work properly, companies have to invest in their back room, their so-called computer system. OK, this you've probably seen. Many of your meters in Singapore were like this. It's called a Ferrara disk meter. Um, they exist all around the world. Many of them are 80 or 90 years old. They used to be calibrated. They probably aren't. Um, they're cheap and easy to read. You do need a person to go and read them, though. Um, they give you very little information except the number of units you've used. And they don't change behavior because they don't tell you when it's more expensive and when it isn't, which means that your grid and your companies can't change the, um, they have to keep building capacity, basically, which maybe is not in anybody's interest. To replace these meters is actually in the company's interest. The calibration's long shot. So they're probably not getting the right money they should for their product. I'll let you read this. Um, I don't think I need to worry you. If you're interested in a real case study, go to the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment of New Zealand. Um, I'll make sure that the slide, the email address, the web address is on the extra slides. OK, I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening and uh, see you later. Bye bye.